Uh, one brief announcement. I know you, you've got a lot of great books. I noticed uh, boxes of books out there. And uh, they'll probably all be confiscated by the TSA at the airport. But uh, as I was telling some of the students earlier, um, uh, years ago, during, around the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Cato Institute had a, a book of essays by libertarian scholars uh, translated into Polish, and they smuggled them into Poland, and their hope was that the border guards would read them. And so when, when you go through the airport and the TSA takes all your books, that it's, it's a good thing. You know, they, 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 they are the border guards, after all. And, uh, and you've got all these free books, but uh, if you want 60 additional air miles on Southwest Airlines, you can buy my latest book. It's got the Politically Incorrect Guide to Economics. It just... The shipment just came in a couple days ago, and it's, the release date is August 16th. So this is sort of an underground uh, distribution of, uh, of my, my latest book there. My, my topic today has to do with, uh, uh, well, the way Joe uh, put it was progressivism and destructionism. And, uh, and destructionism, uh, how many of you have ever read uh, something uh, by, by Mises on destructionism? A couple, a couple of you. In the last several chapters of his uh, famous 19, 1922 book, Socialism, uh, or on what he calls destructionism. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what he had to say about that, because I think it is prescient. It was prescient, uh, as is so much of what uh, Ludwig von Mises wrote in, 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 uh, in his writings. And uh, I want to talk about what has happened since then, at least some aspects of what has happened since then in, in terms of destructionism, because that's what's going on right now in, in spades, uh, the destructionist, socialist destructionism. And so if you read through um, these chapters at the end of the book of Socialism, today it seems quaint and almost trivial of what you know, Mises was dealing with in his day. And he thought it was a big deal, you know, but it's a it's a you know many orders of magnitude a bigger deal, but uh, but a few choice quotes. Uh, uh, hopefully these won't put you to sleep. But uh, he said, "Socialism is the spoiler of what thousands of years of civilization have created. It does not build; it destroys. For destruction is the essence of it. It produces nothing." It only consumes what the social order based on private ownership and the means of production has created. Each step leading towards socialism must exhaust itself in the destruction of what already exists. And uh, when I reread that, I wrote a note in the margin of my notes here that said Venezuela. And it's sort of the latest example of this is when the socialists took over Venezuela it seemed okay for a while, didn't it? If you if you remember reading anything about it, because they were eating up the capital that, you know, Venezuela was one of the wealthiest countries in that part of the world for many years. They're, they're said to have more oil than Saudi Arabia, and they ruined it. And it took a few years because they had, they had what had been built up by earlier generations to live off of. But it didn't take long. It took like a couple of years, and pretty soon you're reading stories about it people who used to have good, well-paying, upper-middle-class jobs rooting through garbage to look for food and killing animals in zoos for meat and things of that sort. And so that's what that reminded me of. Uh, another thing that uh, Macy said was, quote, Marx's disciples have faithfully imitated the master's example, reviling their opponents but never attempting to refute them by argument. And that, that, is, that has always been a classic method of argumentation by, by most Marxists in my experience. Maybe not, there are probably some academic Marxists who, are, who don't behave like this. But, that's, but Mises was saying this in 1922, and you certainly see it today. If you agree with them, if you disagree with them, uh, the, the cultural Marxist about anything, you're a racist, a white supremacist, a Nazi. Um, I just heard that hideously ugly woman on TV, what's her name, Whoopi, uh, so, <laughs> call, calling, uh, calling Turner Point, uh, Turning Point USA, the student group that's having a big convention this week, Nazis. She, so she, she must have read uh, von Mises, you know, is, oh, I'm supposed to call them Nazis. If, uh, and, so, and so that's, and, and you've all, I don't know if you've all experienced that, but you probably have observed that. Then he talked about the, the, uh, the literary tradition known as Romanticism, you know, not, not romance, romanticism. Uh, it says, romanticism is man's revolt against reason. The romantic has a grudge against reality, 
because it is not like the dream world he has created. And, and in this dream world, he hates work, he hates economy, and I, I, which I take to mean economics, and reason. Okay. And again, if you look at it, you know, it reminded me of what he wrote later in his book, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, which I recommend to everybody. It's online for free. They have it here at the Institute. And this, this was probably one of the ideas that, that went into it. And my notes in the margin for this were, were that, you know, read that. And then, you know, in today's world, you can be a man today and a woman tomorrow. You just all you're going to do is declare yourself to be a woman. And that in itself reminded me of a famous passage in the Communist Manifesto, that I could paraphrase, where Karl Marx and Engels said, once they eliminate the division of labor, you could be a farmer in the morning, a literary critic in the evening, a scientist in the afternoon. You know, that's that's socialist man. And, and that seems to be what this this uh, detachment from worldly reality that the, the left has today. Uh, the world is going to end in 12 years unless we, what, uh, adopt socialism, central planning, and, and, uh, and do away with cars. Okay. And we're told that there's a Hitler and, or a Ku Klux Klan guy hiding behind every tree in America. You know, white supremacy, all, the, all these fantasies that, uh, that the left has come up, come, come up with. And, that's, and Mises called that, you know, sort of the plague of romanticism in his day. Another thing he said was all social literature has a thesis to demonstrate. It is ever the same thesis. Capitalism is an evil. Socialism is salvation. And I'm going to talk about that more tomorrow in one of my talks. Literary socialism is an open avowal of destructionism. He said literary, literary socialism. And so that was certainly it was true in his day. And you can imagine that was 1922 when he, when he wrote that. And it, it has all been proven true in, in uh, yeah. In, over and over again uh, since then. Uh, Tom Woods used to say that uh, no, no, no good capitalist deed ever goes unpunished. You know, Walmart is created and starts selling groceries 35, 40% cheaper than the unionized grocery stores. They're attacked and vilified for 20 years for, for that. You know, and so, you know, you know, and on and on. And, and that's, that was Tom's way of uh, expressing this same point. Uh, one more, the, the beginning and end of the socialist policy is destruction. Social art preaches it, schools teach it, the churches disseminate it. Okay, so, so Mises was pretty gloomy in 1922, as you can, you can see. Now, the examples he gave uh, in, these, in these chapters were uh, labor legislation of his day. Uh, this was 1922. In the U.S., we didn't get the minimum wage law until the 30s. And we didn't get really a lot of uh, laws that uh, empowered labor unions, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis non-union labor until the 30s also. But he's probably talking about Germany. Germany had a head start in the welfare state. It was Otto von Bismarck who started the uh, German welfare state in the late 19th century. Social insurance, well, he's talking about early versions of welfare. Union legislation. Well, we later had that in the United States that it empowered unions in the, in the late 30s, 1930s especially. Uh, unemployment insurance, and, and he writes about the moral hazard effect of unemployment insurance. If the government pays you to not work, guess what? People are going to not work so much. And, I, I, and of course, we've all learned that, haven't we, since the, uh, the COVID uh, business started. Uh, I mean, you still see signs everywhere, help wanted uh, everywhere everywhere because of that. Nationalization, taxation, and inflation. So those were Mises' main, main things that he wrote about pretty briefly as the, uh, the essential tools of destruction. And so to, to update that, to try to update that a little, a little bit, uh, one of the things I, I looked at is uh, if you go and get the government's own statistics from uh, the United States government anyway, and uh, total government spending as a percentage of national income. You know how much how much of our income goes to government spending. And, and at the end of the decade, in which uh, Mises published his book, 1929, it was about you would come up with seven percent. Now these are the government statistics. And talk, talk to Sean Rittenauer, by the way. Sean, as a young man, I think he was still a college student, had an internship at the U.S. Department of Labor, and he used to give a great talk here. 
about uh, the the uh, absurdity and ridiculous nature of uh, data gathering at the U.S. Department of, of Labor. So if you're interested in that, I, I was one of one of my favorite Sean Rittenauer talks that, that, uh, that I that I can remember. But seven uh, percent, and if and if you look up the exact same statistic today, uh, government spending as a percent of national income, you get forty five percent, and so and that would tell you that the economy is at least about. 50% socialist uh, just on that measure alone, not, not even considering the effects of government regulation and control of every business in, in America, as far as that goes. And I recommend a publication. How many of you are familiar with this a publication called 10,000 Commandments by the Competitive Enterprise Institute? Nobody? That's good. Uh, so I, that's good because I'm now informing you. If you look up, it's called 10,000 Commandments, published by the Competitive Enterprise Institute every year. And it's a big policy nerd publication, but it gives you an idea of how pervasive uh, government regulation is. Now, none of this existed when Mises wrote Socialism in 1922. The, you know, the, the, even the federal government regulatory agencies of the time in the United States consisted of the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration was brand new, and they weren't doing much. And so this was the dawn of the regulatory age when he wrote this. But if you look up, you know, here's some, I'll, I'll mention a few things that, that are mentioned in this publication, 10,000 Commandments. There's a, a publication called the Federal Register that lists all the government regula federal regulations of business, of, uh, of your home, of life in general, not just business. Um, there are about 44,000 pages of small print uh, to, of the federal government alone regulating your life. In a recent year, Congress passed 97 new laws in one year, but uh, 3,281 new regulatory rules. So they passed 34 regulatory rules for every law that they passed. And when I lived in Maryland, uh, at the end of every legislative session, I would read that they would brag, just brag to the treetops that they had passed between 250 and 300 new laws that year, just the Maryland legislature. And so, and I'm, and I'm sure Maryland is not unique in that regard in passing several hundred new laws of all kinds. Now, some of them are not too uh, onerous. They're like uh, uh, hot dog day in Maryland or something like that. Or, uh, you know, let's, let's celebrate hot dogs. But then they had a law some years ago uh, that instituted a rain tax and they said that, uh, well, you know, these big commercial buildings, when it rains, the rain falls off the asphalt roof and it goes into the, into the sewer system and ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. So that's, that's a negative externality. So we should tax this negative externality. We're going to tax the rain. And so they started measuring the area of the roofs of buildings and then sending tax bills out based on how, much, how big the roof was on, on your building. And if they had carried that out long enough, I imagine that the construction industry would start building sort of slim, tall buildings, you know, to, to, that's what they're going to do. But that's the one instance I can remember of living in that part, in that up there for 25 years, that the Chamber of Commerce actually did something that was useful. And they actually uh, rallied the troops and got rid of the rain tax because it was so, so ridiculous. You know, so, because you, you, know, you had uh, some guy who owned a pizza joint. Getting a getting a bill for thirty thousand dollars all of a sudden, uh, you know, the rain tax bill, and so that that's what put the fire under the butt of uh, of the small business community in, in Maryland, that sort of thing, and so so that's so don't don't forget the state and local governments regulate a lot too. Uh, Larry Kudlow, who's on uh, Fox Business Channel, he's been talking recently. He's I only watch him and Tucker Carlson as I want to when I want to see what uh, Fox is up to. Can't really stomach the rest of them, but he he's coined the phrase regulatory socialism to describe all of this regulatory socialism, and uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. I would call it fascism. Uh, uh, our friend Bob Higgs uh, many years ago said uh, our system, our economic system in the U.S. He called it participatory fascism. Now fascism, from an economic perspective, was private enterprise was permitted but it was uh, very heavily reg regulated, regimented, controlled by the state. So there was sort of de facto socialism, and it was heavily bailed out by the state in Italy and Germany. 
you know, bailout, kind of like the, the 2008-2009 bailouts. Uh, that was, uh, I, even, I remember blogging uh, that at the time with a big long quote from a book on fascism of how they did this in Italy, bailing out, because these were, they considered them to be their industries, you know, the state did. And although the, the proprietors were allowed to earn some profits, they allowed a little bit of profit incentive to exist in there because they had to produce all, the, all those guns and airplanes and tanks and, and so forth somehow. And so, and so I, I would just call it old-fashioned socialism, but Kudlow calls it regulatory, uh, regulatory or fascism, rather. He calls it regulatory socialism. Now, one of the lessons uh, from von Mises about this, about regulation, is one of the effects of that is every, every minute every business person has to spend complying with government regulation is, a, is a, a minute or an hour that he or she is not spending producing better products, figuring out how to cut their costs, prices, marketing the products, and, and so forth. So that's, that's the opportunity cost of this. Uh, and uh, every time I, when I used to lecture this, I used to give examples of a friend of mine in Baltimore who ran several, who owned several uh, print shops, uh, Curry Printing, the franchise, and she told me that she would spend at least 50% of every workday just complying with government regulations because the printing business with all the, the printing and the chemicals and everything is very heavily regulated by the EPA and the state EPA and, and, and everything else. And she would have much rather been out uh, r rounding up more business and dealing with customers than dealing with government bureaucrats who would come in there and threaten her with fines and just uh, just awful but that was her miserable existence, she's told me, for, uh, because of all the regulation. And so then, it's, like I said, this, this didn't, this barely existed when, uh, when Mises wrote this. Another thing that has, that has happened is we've had what I call the watermelon revolution, which I'm going to talk about in more detail tomorrow. A watermelon is, uh, of course, green on the outside, but red on the inside. And so the environmentalist uh, revolution. And, uh, and I don't want to steal my own thunder, but one thing I'll, I'll uh, uh, point you to is there's a, an article sort of famous in our circles by Robert Heilbrunner. Uh, who know, anybody here, who has heard of Robert Heilbrunner? You can raise your hand if you... Well, that's great. That's great that all, all, only Lou and me uh, have, heard, have heard. That's great that you have it. But he wrote this book called The Worldly Philosophers. And if you were a college student from the late 60s to through the 80s, and you took principles of economics, chances are you were forced to read the worldly philosophers. It was mostly the, uh, the, the biggest statists in the economics profession. You didn't even have an entry for Milton Friedman, for goodness sake, and uh, let alone uh, Ludwig von Mises. And, and, and so that's, that's what we were supposed to learn about the history of economic thought from Robert Howard. He was a lifelong socialist, but after the collapse of socialism around the world, he wrote this essay in the New Yorker magazine, September 10th, 1990, called After Communism. And, you know, he was a mea culpa. He, he said Mises was right all along. Yeah, he got it wrong. He got the reasons why Mises was right. But he, he said Mises was right. He said, you know, the, the great debate between capitalism and socialism is over. You know, this you know, socialism collapsed everywhere. And look at look how wealthy and affluent uh, the capitalist countries are. But then at the end, he says, but don't despair. He's, he's preaching to his fellow socialists. He says, we can make a comeback. Those aren't his words. Those are my words. But he, and the comeback can be in the form of envir environmentalism. He said this, socialism must, must emerge if humanity is to deal with the ecological crisis. Socialism must emerge. And he wrote this in 1990 at a time when the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe had just imploded Okay, and journalists and others for the first time in decades were able to go and take a look around the socialist world. And what they found was an environmental, I'll call it a hellhole. I won't call it what it really was. But, but the, the, the environmental problems were many orders of magnitude worse than anything ever seen in this country. There's, there's a book about it called Ecocide in the USSR. It's one book. Uh, uh, a political scientist named Marshall Goldman wrote a book in the 70s, and he, he somehow got information probably from the CIA about, uh, you know, how else would you get information about behind the Iron Curtain in the 1970s? And he wrote this book about environmental issues, but he turned out to be right on, on the money in terms of the environmental degradation under socialism uh, because nobody owned anything. 
uh, the state claimed ownership of everything, and so there's little incentive to take care of the environment if uh, you don't, there's no property ownership, no liability law uh, uh, that was enforced. And so you could uh, pollute, and, and, the, and, the, and the governments of these countries just polluted at will because they wanted to compete with America in, 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 in industry. They wanted to prove socialism was the way to go. And so, the, and that didn't exist in, uh, in Macy's time either. And that's all I'm going to say about that, I, that, uh, that that has to be added. Now, the Hayek uh, redefined socialism in, in one of the, I think the 1976 edition of The Road to Serfdom, uh, where, uh, where he said uh, uh, socialism, well, yeah, the, the, the government ownership of the means of production, that's, that's socialism. But it's also, he re redefined it to include <coughs> the institutions of the welfare state and income taxation and the, the redistributive nature of income taxation. And of course, uh, I would add also uh, Kudlow's regulatory socialism, if you want to know what socialism is. That's uh, fascism, after, after all, was a form of socialism. The Nazi, not the word Nazi, was in National, Social, National German Socialist uh, Workers' Party. Uh, okay. And so those things ought also need to be added to, uh, to the, the template that Mises put together in his book Socialism. And then, and I'm going to talk more about this, another thing I'm going to talk more about uh, tomorrow, uh, cultural Marxism, okay, with this, with this relentless attacks on Christianity, the family, Western civilization in, in general. Uh, that, was, that didn't exist in 1922 either. That came about uh, mostly in the 1940s by some disgruntled uh, Marxists, uh, European Marxists, who were uh, disgruntled that uh, the working class did not embrace uh, communism. And, and so they blamed Christianity. They said uh, the, the working class was too, too attached to Christianity. And, you know, if you think God is your savior, then, well... Joe Biden cannot be your savior, or whoever, <laughs> Mussolini, Hitler, whoever, you know, Stalin, uh, they can't be your savior. So, so we've got we to do something about that. We've got to get rid of Christianity. The family, if you're attached to your family, well, well, that's a problem because your parents could teach you uh, uh, morals. And, uh, and, uh, and we can't have, like, as Joe Biden uh, said a couple weeks ago when he said, uh, when your kids are in the public schools, they belong to us, they don't belong to you. And that, he could have, that could have been one of the early 20th century communists saying the exact same thing. That's where the, and that's where the, uh, the so-called cultural Marxists of the, the so-called Frankfurt School. Uh, and by the way, it was originally, they had this institute in uh, Germany. They, they originally called it the Institute for Marxism. But then someone must have said, oh, now wait a minute, Stalin has killed tens of millions of people. Are you sure you want to be associated? So they called it uh, the Institute for Social Research. And, who could be against? Who could criticize social research? You know, so, you know, it's the science. You know, they're all about the science, social science. Okay, and so, uh, and, and then a Western civilization, you know, the rule of law, constitutionalism, uh, and so forth. Well, that stood in the way of Marxism. So these things, these are things that they decided all had to be destroyed. And uh, and like I said, uh, I'm going to talk more in more more detail about that tomorrow of how they, they've gone about that, and that's what we're seeing today. And Mises will not, of course, be surprised at what happened to American universities, uh, which even in his time, in human action, he called, he called uh, tax-funded universities, universities nurseries for socialism. Nurseries for socialism. And I, uh, I quote him a bit in the final chapter of my new book. Remember, I have 60, free, 60 air mile, miles on uh, Southwest Airlines if you buy this book before you leave. You, know, you, you, you can qualify for the competition anyway. And, and in human action, here's some of the things that Mises said about the university system. He said, tax-supported universities are under the sway, always under the sway of the party in power. The authorities try to appoint only professors who are ready to advance the ideas of which they improve themselves. That was true in his day. You know, we, we see it today. We see it today. And, uh, and, and again, orders of magnitude more. Uh, I'll tell you, give you one anecdote about this. When, uh, when was it? this was around 1990, and I was at the University of Tennessee, and there was uh, 
uh, a young libertarian historian who had just uh, earned his PhD in history from a prestigious university. And he had great credentials. Uh, he sent me his resume because he, he saw that there was a job opening in the history department at my university. I wasn't in the history department. I was in economics, but I was in, in history. And he sent this to me. And, and, he's, and he's, he's asking me if I had any suggestions to help him get this, a job there. And he, said, he sent me a second resume. And he says, this is my political resume. And it had, you know, he, was, he had been... Uh, associated with Young Americans for Freedom or you know, conservative groups. And he said, for, for God's sake, don't let them see my other resume. Only show them my academic resume. And, uh, and, so, and then this, this particular person uh, took him, uh, I believe, seven years to get a decent job. He kind of bounced around. He had a few gigs at a community college. And uh, he worked for one of the libertarian uh, uh, foundations for a while. But... And he had, uh, you know, Ivy League credentials. And, uh, and, and so, so and, and Mises saw all this. He said, um, all the, all the non-socialist governments, Mises wrote, non-socialist, you know, were firmly committed to government interventionism and appointed only interventionists as professors. The first duty of the university was, therefore, to sell the official social philosophy to the rising generation. And as such, they had no use for economists. Okay. But then he also says, he, he sort of gives some students a pat on the back, okay? He says, you know, the majority of the students espouse without any inhibitions the interventionist panaceas recommended by the professors. But there is always a remnant. He talks about there's always a remnant. And, and as you are the remnant. You know, the people like you are the remnant that, that, that we rely on to quit uh, spouting these things. You know, I taught, you know, I retired from my university job a couple of years ago. Uh, it was, it, you know, which was a good thing for me. It, uh, it became so uh, uh, intolerable, the political correctness and the, the absurdities. And it, it was just the, the fantasy world that, that I quoted Mises saying that left his life to live in. And I, that's, that was my work world, this fantasy world that, that I went to every day. And I always marveled over the past 10 or 15 years where I had so many students who just could not understand supply and demand, opportunity costs, marginal, they just couldn't, just couldn't get it. You can get, it didn't compute, but boy, they could stand up and give you a two hour lecture about recycling, you know, like that, you know, like that, or, or, or whatever, you know, the, the latest left-wing fad, because it had been drilled in their heads since, since preschool. And these are uh, 19, 20 year old, 21 year old students. And so that's, you know, you drill something into somebody's head repeated enough times over 20 years, 15 years, and uh, some of it will catch on. And, and that's, the, but I always had a remnant, too. I always had a remnant, too. Like uh, the one student that I sent here, it came to Macy's University. He was a senior economics major taking my American economic history class. And he told me he had taken all the classes in monetary theory, money and banking, principles of macro, intermediate macro, even had mathematical macro. And he told me, I had no idea there were criticisms of the Fed. This is the first time I've ever heard a criticism. <laughs> true story, absolutely true story. And he came, he came here and, and, uh, and attended Mises University and got an overload of, of what he missed out on during his, his, uh, his college education. Uh, another student that, uh, from Mises, years ago at Mises University went to my alma mater, Virginia Tech, and she invited me to come to Virginia Tech and give a talk to her student group. And she said uh, she was about to graduate with a degree in economics, and all she had learned was game theory. And she said, I thought before I graduated, I, uh, my fellow students and I should learn something about economics, so I came to Mises University. And, <laughs> and, so, and, so, uh, and so Mises was talking about this in 1922. How many of you are familiar with the capture theory of regulation? Does that ring a bell? Okay. Well, that's good again, because most of you aren't. The capture theory of regulation is sort of associated with the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, and uh, basically, there was, a, there was a big body of research that looked at the origins of regulation. Uh, the classic example was uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission in the United States was created to regulate the railroads in 1887. And the first head of the Interstate Commerce Commission 
was a railroad industry president. Okay, now the theory that you're taught in school is that the market had failed and therefore the government created this regulatory agency to act in the public interest to protect consumers from monopoly or something like that. But the person, the first person the government put in charge of running this was a railroad company president. <laughs> and so they regulated it for the railroads. And the first thing they did, there was controversy over people like John D. Rockefeller were given uh, quantity discounts. Because if you're shipping uh, a half a million barrels of oil a year, we're going to give you a good price compared to the guy who's shipping a thousand barrels a year from his tiny little uh, oil well somewhere, okay? And so the smaller companies didn't like that. It was unfair that the Rockefellers of the world were getting a, a discount. So the first thing the ICC did was to outlaw discounts and so that you know, nobody gets a discount. <laughs> and, and, and it went on from there. And they, they ended up regulating trucking you know, afterwards. And so the, the phrase regulation for the regulated became popular among the Chicago school same thing happened with the airlines. There, there were more airline, commercial airlines in the United States in 1922 than there were in 1972 because the Civil Aeronautics Board was regulated for the benefit of the airline industries, and they basically ran it as a cartel. So that's the capture theory of regulation. Now, uh, I, don't, I call it the immaculate conception theory of regulation because the, the story that they still tell the Chicago School is that it was, all, it was all nice at the beginning. It was all uh, angelic, that they had good intentions, they wanted to serve the public interest, but then they were captured. You know, they, they were surrounded and captured. But the reality of it is, in, in most of these instances, it was the industries itself that lobbied for and got these, these agencies to be created. It wasn't uh, enlightened, public-spirited politicians that, that created these things. It was politicians who had been bribed by corporations to, to, start, to start these things. And Butler Schaefer wrote a good book about this, and so did Gabriel Kolko. Uh, if, you wanna, if, you, if you're interested in this, uh, this sort of, they're, they're the, this two uh, outliers on, on, uh, on, on, on regulating. Butler Schaefer, was an, the late Butler Schaefer, was an old friend of ours. You know, he, he lectured here many times, a uh, friend of the, uh, the Mises Institute. But uh, if you want to look up books on that. Now, the reason I bring this up is this, of course, all happened mostly after Mises' day. Not all. The ICC existed in the U.S. Uh, during his day. But I bring this up because in today's world, we have entire governments being captured by, by political forces that want to impose socialism. The World Economic Forum brags that... Its people now run the governments of Canada, New Zealand, Australia, France, and other governments. You know, uh, I think I think Lou Rockwell calls uh, the president of France a macaroon. Does he call him President Macaroon? Uh, and, and it's Macron, uh, not macaroon. I like macaroon better. And the uh, the tyrant in Canada, and they all come from they all come from this you know, this training program of the World Economic Forum in Davos, you know, with their famous meetings in Davos, Switzerland. And so, so these people, in my view, have captured entire governments. They're not, they haven't just captured individual government agencies. They've captured entire governments, Canada, France, uh, and Australia, and others. And even I was shocked at how totalitarian Fran Australia all of a sudden became uh, during the, the COVID business. And they had to have had this game plan all ready to go when, when this happened because it was so fast. And, uh, and, you know, the, being one of the worst countries in the world. Okay. So that's another thing that I would add uh, here. Now, the next point I would make about uh, destructionism is if you consider this in a, a bit of a historical perspective, when World War, world War I occurred, the international division of labor was severely shrunken. Or, you know, world War you know, uh, the, the international commerce stopped when World, when World War I occurred, okay? And then we had uh, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff in 1929, 1930, that uh, instigated an international trade war that shrunk uh, world trade by two-thirds in three years, 
just that. And then we had the Great Depression, which, again, pretty much uh, closed down world trade. Then World War II comes, and, and world trade. Then the Cold War, all the Cold War years, and, and a huge part of the planet uh, was disengaged from the international division of labor, from capitalism. And so all, for 80 years, we had this, uh, this, this big impairment of capitalism because of all the, the war, socialism, government interventionism, tariff wars, and so forth that shut down, locked down a big part of the global, all of China, all of the Russian Empire, and, and, and so forth. And it finally opened up a bit with the worldwide collapse of socialism, okay? And the point I want to make here is that the forces of evil today have figured out how to do this without all those wars and socialism and nationalized industries and international tariff wars. All they do is let a little virus out of a jar and declare that they're going to lock down the world economy. And it all worked, didn't it? They, they literally locked down the world economy for, for a pretty long period of time. And they achieved the destruction of the international division of labor, for a time anyway, without going through all the rigmarole of, of wars and, and, and every, all the other stuff that occurred during the 20th century. And we even have the uh, researchers, researchers at the University of East Anglia, which is... Uh, one of the hotbeds of global warming hysteria always has been, you know, for, for decades anyway, saying, well, we should do this every, every other year just as a matter of course, just lock down the entire world economy, just tell everybody stop, you know, and, and just, 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 for, just for general purposes. And that's what they're working on today in, in the United States with the attack on energy, attacks on energy. So they did it without a world war. Another thing that happened... Uh, that the, the progressives uh, have uh, blessed us with. There's something uh, that came about in the 60s uh, in the political science literature that was known as the Cloward-Piven strategy. I call it the Cloward-Piven-Obama strategy. And Cloward and Piven were two political science professors. They were leftists. And basically their strategy, what their plan was, or their plot, was a mass expansion of welfare uh, accompanied with vote fraud in order to, uh, to achieve this, the mass expansion of welfare, open borders uh, to put even more people on welfare. And their, their writings said, if we did this, mass expansion of welfare and a massive uh, enrollment of voting of legal and illegal aliens, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, open borders, then we will basically bankrupt the government. And uh, so many people will become destitute, they will have to have a guaranteed annual income. The government will have to just print up enough money to put most of the population, uh, you know, in, in their view, uh, the ideal would be all of the population on guaranteed government income, which was basically totalitarian communism, isn't it? In, that, in the Soviet Union, everybody worked for the government and they paid you whatever they thought uh, would keep you alive. Uh, uh, when I when I used to teach uh, a lecture on the theory of subsistence wages, Marx's theory of subsistence wages, and I would have my students read what Mises had to say about that. And of course, the only real examples of that in, in uh, history in the last couple hundred years were socialism you know, in, the, in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. That's where where they gave people subsistence wages to live on, not capitalism. So once again, Marx had it all backwards yeah, as far as that. So that 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 strategy came about in the, in the 1960s, and they've been pretty successful with it. It began with the Motor Voter Act of 1993, where it made it much easier to register to vote. And, and the welfare state has had that effect. It has sort of uh, degraded generations of lower income people of all races and, uh, and for, it forced them into uh, pretty bad con conditions. Um, I've written, years ago, I wrote about this group called ACORN. How many of you have ever heard of ACORN? Yeah, more, more than have heard of uh, some of the other academic literature I, I mentioned. Like, <laughs> Association of Community or, uh, Organizations for Reform Now. That's, the acronym is ACORN. I, I, I read that they've gone out of business. 
But they were in business for when, when Barack Obama graduated from Harvard Law School. He went right to Acorn. That was, that was when, you know, could you imagine somebody saying, I'm going to go through the ordeal of getting a law degree from Harvard so I can work at Acorn? <laughs> and and, and voting, voter registration, okay, which was, which you, the Acorn style of voter registration is what you saw in the 2020 presidential election. That's, that's what Obama was famous for. I don't know if you, the students here remember when Obama first ran for president, he, his claim to fame of what his, he was, what uh, professionally was community organizer, you know, working for Acorn. You know, he was their, their lawyer. Okay. Another thing Acorn was known for was a, a bit of an extortion racket and that they would uh, go to uh, banks and accuse them of not making enough loans to minorities, whether there's any truth to it or not. And they said, we'll shut up as long as you give us Acorn, millions of dollars, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll also make some bad loans to unqualified minority borrowers at the same time. But then, you know, us, Acorn, we'll get, you know, 10 million, 20 million. There was one uh, uh, knockoff organization in Boston that got a billion dollars from banks. Uh, and believe it or not, the head of it was a guy named Marx, M A R K S, not, not, <laughs> not with an X, but his name is Marx. And, and his organization was sort of an Acorn clone. And it was in the Wall Street Journal. He, he, he got over a billion dollars in this way for this, this organization. And so, so, so that, and that's, and they, they went a long way toward creating this, this subprime crisis of 2008 because that was part of the political impetus for, for all these loans. My next door neighbor at the time was a mortgage broker, and I played golf with him, and he's, he was just bragging to the treetops about all the money he was making uh, on no-doc loans. And so I, of course, the naive me, said, what's a no-doc loan? And there was, of course, uh, to certain customers, you don't, you don't need a W-2 form. You don't need a tax return or any documents at all. He said, uh, the government just said for these people, uh, just show that they've signed up for credit counseling, and that's good enough. And, uh, and you give them a, home, give them a $300,000 home loan, no-doc loan. Loans, and so it was just turn the crank and, and and take those fees and collect those fees for the mortgage loans. Okay, and so one other one final thing, I'll mention, uh, and this is not Mises. This uh, Hayek wrote in uh, his book, The Constitution of Liberty, that uh, there's a whole chapter uh, uh, arguing why socialists have always attacked the whole idea of individual responsibility. And there's a whole chapter in the Constitution of Liberty on, on, on this and, and why this is. Because if, if you're responsible for yourself, then, well, then the state is not responsible for you. And, you know, if, if you're responsible for yourself, then you're responsible for defending yourself, too. And you should own a gun to, to defend yourself in today's world. You can't have that. So, so we have this relentless attack on individual responsibility. And it existed in Mises' time in 1922 when he wrote Socialism. But, but again, you know, we've seen this you know, really blossom, the attacks on individual responsibility since then. Okay, the final thing I want to mention here about destructionism is also from Hayek uh, and the road to serfdom. You know, when, uh, when two, after 2008 happened, our friends Tom Woods and Yuri Maltsev went on the Glenn Beck uh, television show. He had a show on uh, Fox at the time. And Glenn Beck wanted to talk to them about The Road to Serfdom. And The Road to Serfdom went to number one on Amazon sales the next day. And, and so on that, one, that same day, I contacted the Mises Institute, and we were teaching online classes under the Mises Academy at the time, and I proposed a course on The Road to Serfdom. And so I taught a five-week course several, several times. I did it on the road to serfdom. The students all over the world, and students from all over the world, they, they read the road to serfdom and had a five-week class on it. It wasn't, it wasn't like the graduate program. There's no credit. It was just for free. But I even had active duty military guys in Iraq uh, taking the class uh, on that. It was so popular. And so, but anyway, here's some of the things in some of the, one of the latter chapters, and this should ring true to you. This should be very familiar to today's world. This is the 1943 that Hayek was writing this. There's a chapter called The End of Truth. The End of Truth. So this is the last thing I'm going to talk about is what's being destroyed. 
and, and by, by the socialists uh, these days. Official myths are necessary to justify government actions. Uh, read my Lincoln books, for example. No, whatever. <laughs> self from, self from, or my Hamilton book, for that matter. Official myths. In fact, I've, he used, Hayek uses the word official myths. And James Bennett and I co-authored a book in 1992 entitled Official Lies, How Washington Misleads Us. And so uh, I can't say that Hayek plagiarized us because uh, he wrote this in 1943 and our book was 1992. But uh, maybe you, I, I didn't plagiarize him either on the, the, that language, but, but I, I just ran across that when I reread this. He says, quote, pseudoscientific theory becomes the official creed. Okay. I was just reading this morning. Anthony Fauci said, I never argued for lockdowns. <laughs> and then there's an article in Breitbart today that gives uh, videos of Fauci advocating lockdowns. <laughs> you know, but he came out yesterday and said, oh, me? I, uh, I, never, I never advocated lockdowns. Okay, it's a pseudo-scientific theory. Hayek said, quote, the minority who will retain a proclivity to criticize must be silenced. Okay, well, what else is Twitter and Instagram for, after all, and Facebook? Okay. Every act of the government must become sacrosanct and exempt from criticism. He's talking about totalitarianism. Now, you know, think about how true that is of American society today and the whole West, Australia, France, Canada, and, and so forth. Every act of government must become sacrosanct. A friend of mine who's a physician in Montana gave a fabulous talk about the COVID scam very early on. I think it was April 2020, uh, a public talk. It was on, on the web, and uh, her hospital kicked her out. Again, didn't kick her out, but they, they withdrew her privileges at the hospital where she would send her patients to. So to this day, she has to send her patients to a different doctor, and that doctor can get them admitted to the hospital but her patients can't get admitted to the hospital. And this is in uh, Flathead Valley, Montana. And every year, the Flathead Valley, Montana has one of these, uh, a newspaper, that the best of, you know, best auto repair joint, best restaurant, best doctor. She's the best doctor. Every last three years in a row, best, doc, best family doctor. And, and, but she can't practice. And she's kicked out of the hospital, basically, because of this great talk about how they were, they were, uh, uh, fudging the statistics on COVID cases in, in April of 2020. Okay. Public criticism or expressions of desout, doubt must be suppressed. The same thing. You know, keep in mind, Hayek here is writing in 1943. He's, he's sitting there at Cambridge University uh, taking turns with John Maynard Keynes on the roof of the buildings watching for the Luftwaffe to come by and drop bombs on Cambridge. And literally, you know, he, I, I, I personally heard Hayek say this in, in, at Cambridge University in 1984. It might be a big story, but I heard him say, but he told, he told a group of 700 at the Mount Pelerin Society meeting in 1984. That's, that's where he wrote most of the, he claims that's where he wrote most of the, uh, the road to serfdom on the roof watching for the Nazi bombers. But, uh, but it may be a story because he also told a story at that same meeting. Uh, he said, I understand there's a man in the audience who uh, really should be the co-author of The Road to Serfdom. And I haven't seen him in 40 years. But I understand he's here tonight. Where is he? And this old man with white hair stands up in, uh, in, in, in a very emotional moment. These are all Hayek worshipers, the Mont Pelerin Society. He, he founded the Mont Pelerin Society with with the help of Mises and others. And, uh, you know, 700 people get up, a big cheer. And the next day, my friend Jim Bennett and I are going to a pub for lunch, and here's the old man sitting there, the white-haired old man, the, the, the rightful co-author of The Road to Serfdom. And I had to say, wow, that was some story. You should be the co-author of The Road to Serfdom. And this guy says, I don't know what Hayek is talking about. I go out to the theater with him in London all the time, and it just... This is a big story. He made he made the whole thing up, and so so <laughs> Hayek, uh, and so when when he came to George Mason when I was on the faculty there and gave a talk, uh, he gave a, a a caveat at the beginning. He says, "Yeah, I'm not what I used to be." He said, uh, "He said I think I went senile for a while, but I quit smoking 
and it brought my brain wave back. He was a jokester, like that. But anyway, so I'm reading. I'm reading from the Road to Serfdom here, and then it's one final thing he says in the disciplines dealing directly with human affairs, such as history, law, or economics. The disinterested, dinner, disinterested search for truth cannot be allowed. Well, this certainly sounds like a lot of what's going on in universities today, to, to be sure. And I, and I could tell you, uh, give you, a, I could stand up here for the next three days telling stories about this. Finally, truth itself is no longer something to be found, but becomes something to be laid down by authority. The end of truth in a totalitarian system, and all I can think all I can think of when I reread that was uh, was Fauci saying, "I am the science." <laughs> you know, science is not the science. I am the I am the science. And these people, they actually say these things. You know, at least in, in the Hayek's day, I don't think they came out and said these things, but they're so arrogant now because they know, or they think anyway, that we will just sit back and take it, and uh, they are the science. And now they're even admitting that they lied to us. This Burks woman, the, the creepy woman with the scarfs that was on TV all the time during the COVID uh, uh, thing, she wrote a whole book uh, bragging that she lied uh, about this. And I've been thinking of writing an article about why she would lie, admit this. And uh, I'm not sure I know why she would admit this, but she did. And, uh, and so, but, so Hayek had, had this all nailed in 1943, and it fits in with what uh, his mentor, Ludwig von Mises, was saying in socialism you know, a couple of decades earlier. And uh, one thing I left out in my talk when I was talking about regulation is in addition to all those regulations, the 45,000 pages, in the U.S. we have all these czars. You know, czar, there's a, a czar for everything. A czar, like there's an AIDS czar. This is a presidential appointee that doesn't have to go through the senatorial process of being, you know, uh, voted on by the Senate. And uh, there's a list online of all the czars. And, uh, and some of these, uh, I look at these like, how can I get a job like this? It probably pays a big salary. And I wrote down some of my favorites. There's an AFPAC czar, Afghanistan and Pakistan, AFPAC czar. There's an Asian carp czar. That's the job I would want, the Asian <laughs> carp czar. This is the biggest knee slapper, a financial stability czar. <laughs> Imagine the government. The bird flu czar. Maybe I want that one and not the Asian carp. Climate change czar, a, censor, a censorship czar. I guess his job is to make sure there's a lots and more and more censorship every year. Okay, A sexual assault czar. What is an Ebola czar, how about that? Global AIDS czar, and a homelessness czar. Well, he's doing a good job, isn't he, the homelessness czar? <laughs> if I was president, I would give the homelessness czar a shovel and send him to San Francisco. That's what I would do. <laughs> and, uh, and that's my story for now. I guess uh, we'll have time for questions if you have any, any questions. What's that? You don't have time? What, well, who were you to say we don't have time? <laughs> who is this guy? No, we don't have time.